Good morning, everyone. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Thanks for joining. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. We'll go through a bit of the orientation to what's what lies ahead um, as people join in. Um, welcome again to this multi-part series on COVID-19 clinical TA. The webinar is hosted by USAID's Sustaining Technical and Analytic Resources and UCSF with support from USAID's Oxygen Ecosystem Initiative. Over the next hour or so, um, we're going to be discussing some key considerations in scaling up oxygen infrastructure from the equipment to practical aspects of training providers and the essentials of oxygen delivery. There's gonna be two presenters followed by Q&A uh, from our panel. Um, I will introduce the panelists in just a moment here, but before we get started, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. George Cyberry, Oxygen Ecosystem Initiative Lead for USAID. Thanks very much, Dr. Lipnick. Uh, just a brief uh, note of welcome to everyone to what I know will be another fantastic webinar in this series. Uh, an appreciation um, to Dr. Lipnick and the lecturers today for um, putting this on, making sure it's available in multiple, multiple languages, recording it for availability after, and be, for being really so responsive uh, to what our clinical implementation partners and colleagues are finding important and necessary as they work to take care of patients with COVID in their countries. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Lipman. Thanks, Dr. Cyberry. So before we get started this morning, I just want to remind everybody that we'll be recording. Also the information that is presented here, uh, both by our presenters and during the question and answer session does not constitute medical advice. The lectures are intended to be educational in nature and data on COVID-19 management is rapidly evolving. As Dr. Cyberry pointed out, this is being recorded, but also transmitted in both English, Spanish, as well as French. The language can be selected at the bottom of the menu panel as shown here. Please stay on mute during the presentation, but we will uh, welcome questions from you during the talks. Please enter those questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom and we will collect those and answer them during the Q&A portion after the presenters have finished. The webinars are the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month. Um, please send any requests for additional topics to either myself or Lauren Wall using the email addresses below. And the upcoming schedule can be found on the Open Critical Care portal. For those of you who are not familiar, these are some of the tools that will be referenced uh, at various points during the talk today. Um, and specific to the presentation, there are a few papers that are going to be mentioned, um, which have been posted onto the portal in the resource library. So moving on to the presentations, um, I'd like to introduce 
Dr. Tim Baker. He's a critical care physician and researcher based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. He's a member of the faculty at Muhambili University of Health and Allied Sciences and Ifakara Health Institute in Tanzania. He's also an associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK and at Karolinska Institute and Karolinska University Hospital in Sweden. Dr. Baker works to evaluate and improve health services and systems focusing on the provision of good quality care to critically ill patients in low resource settings. He has developed the concept of essential emergency and critical care and is leading several research projects and groups. Tim's a consultant for the WHO, UNICEF, and the World Bank and founder of the NGO Life Support Foundation. Uh, Dr. Baker is also a part of the uh, STAR UCSF technical advisory group for this project. It's also my pleasure to introduce Dr. Raphael Kizuduli. Raphael is a nurse working in critical care in Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre, Malawi. He's a nurse educator for intensive care nursing and chair for Life Support Foundation Malawi Working Group. His current work includes several critical care research and quality improvement projects in the high dependency unit and end of life care in the intensive care unit in Malawi. Uh, Raf is also a student of epidemiology at the College of Medicine in Blantyre. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Robert Neighbor. Uh, Mr. Neighbor is a chartered engineer and fellow of the Institution of Engineering and Technology. He spent a significant proportion of his career in low and middle income countries, installing and maintaining anesthetic and ICU equipment, as well as oxygen delivery systems. Uh, there he's worked to train people in use and maintenance, um, has specialized in designing and providing medical equipment suitable for harsh environments, areas with lim limited logistical support and conflict situations. Uh, he's past recipient of the Langton Hewer Award from the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland for service to the discipline of anesthesiology. Mr. Neighbor is also a member of the STAR UCSF Technical Advisory Group for uh, Respiratory Care and Oxygen Ecosystem Projects. So without any further delay, uh, I will turn over the screen to uh, Dr. Tim Baker and Raf Kazaduli for their presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lipnick. Uh, let's just get this presentation in the right mode. Thank you so much for inviting uh, us to talk uh, at this uh, meeting today. It's a real honor. Um, and today, uh, uh, Raf and I will present um, for the, about the next 40 minutes on optimizing the impact of oxygen scale up. So we want to talk about how we can uh, provide effective therapy for oxygen to our patients uh, and include the other care uh, which these patients very often require, which can be summarized in the term essential emergency and critical care. Uh, the outline of the talk today, we're going to go through uh, what the oxygen scale up looks like, how uh, effective oxygen therapy can be given, uh, we'll touch on the, the, the severity of the patients who we are talking about for this, um, and we'll move on to the, uh, the care uh, of, of these patients um, beyond oxygen. And to cut a long story short, what uh, we want uh, to be taken home from this talk um, is, is concepts around the fact that increasing oxygen uh, in the world is really crucial, both for the COVID-19 pandemic, but also for, for many other diseases and all the different care that can be seen as essential health services. So oxygen is really important. We, we need to think that oxygen uh, is, is quite a complex system uh, and we need to ensure that our systems get the oxygen all the way to the patient's nose, down into their airways, which can be, can be seen as the last mile uh, of oxygen uh, supply. Um, oxygen is one of the kind of key things that is needed by patients who are severe and critical. Um, and we need to make sure it's provided to the right patients at the right time and in the right way if we want to optimize its impact. And moving beyond oxygen, there is other essential care for patients with emergency disease, with critical illness, uh, that we should also provide if we're going to uh, increase the impact of oxygen and save many lives throughout the world. So that's what we're going to talk about. We'll begin with oxygen scale up. 
Um, so as we all know, in this pandemic, there's been a, a real surge of acute illness of very sick patients uh, and, and of deaths throughout the world. Uh, primarily, primarily as a result of breathing problems, uh, although patients also suffer, for, suffer from uh, um, many different organ system um, uh, consequences of the virus. The main breathing problems they get uh, lead the patient to become hypoxic, low levels of oxygen in their body, and to develop respiratory failure. And the primary uh, well-known therapies for this are, can be summarized with, with oxygen and mechanical ventilation. Now, mechanical ventilation was something then that was discussed about uh, very early on in the pandemic and emphasized uh, in a very big way. Um, and definitely it is a life-saving therapy for, for, for lots of patients with critical illness. I'm an intensive care doctor myself, and I really uh, have seen the positive effects of mechanical ventilation. It's a, great, uh, it's a great therapy. However, we do need to be aware that it's a very complex intervention uh, that does require a whole system around it that's very sophisticated if it's to be effective and if we are going to avoid the quite serious potential harms that it can cause. This system includes things like uh, very well-trained uh, health workers working according to very established routines. Um, it needs a reliable and extensive oxygen supply to function. Uh, and it only really works in the context of, of an intensive care unit providing quite advanced care. So we need to think of things like supporting the patient's circulation, sedating the patient, providing adequate pain relief, nutrition, Often these patients get complications, those need to be treated. We need equipment such as syringe drivers, infusion pumps, and so on. Um, and it struck me very much at the start of the pandemic that, that there was a, a kind of atmosphere around that all we need to do is provide these machines and we will save many lives. Uh, and I think it's really important to understand it doesn't work like that. The machine requires a lot of other things around it can be seen that, uh, that ICU care, uh, including mechanical ventilation, is therefore very expensive with, with the few uh, reports when people have tried to add up costs, uh, over $2,000 per patient in India, over 6,000 in South Africa. Um, and these numbers have to be related to what uh, countries are currently able to spend uh, on healthcare. Several uh, low-income countries are only spending about 40 US dollars per person per year on healthcare. So, so these numbers, for looking after an intensive care unit patient are quite huge. Um, you can see in high income countries the average health expenditure is roughly $3,000. So, so mechanical ventilation ICU care is a little bit more understandable in those settings, but in a place which has only got $40, it's a bit more hard to justify. Um, and we need very intensive human resources. So staffing is such a key issue. Uh, often in the ICUs, you require one-to-one -one nursing, so one nurse for one patient, um, whereas if you're only providing oxygen and more basic level care, you can get away with uh, six patients or even up to 20 patients for, for one nurse if you really need to. Um, in many settings in the world, there's very few doctors and nurses with uh, adequate training in intensive care. For example, Malawi, which we're going to come back to several times in this talk, uh, currently has five or, or now six uh, specialist anesthesiologists uh, for a country of over 17 million people. And what we've seen uh, putting all this together is sadly quite poor outcomes um, in intensive care. Mortality rates, uh, this is even before the pandemic for patients receiving mechanical ventilation in low resource settings of, of roughly 50%. So, so it's, it's a very difficult therapy that doesn't provide great outcomes. Um, what countries have tended to have then is, is very few ICU beds, uh, often located in the central facilities, the university hospitals, maybe some private hospitals in the capital cities of countries. Um, if we look at Kenya, this is before the pandemic, there was 250 ICU beds for a population of 53 million and uh, Malawi had 25 ICU beds. Um, if we compare that to England, which had 4,400, and Germany, which is one of the most uh, dense uh, popular um, amount of ICU beds per population in the world, had 28,000. So there's really, it's really very different settings we're dealing with. One, one solution for COVID uh, in one setting will not necessarily be translatable to, to all settings in the world. 
So if we think mechanical ventilation, yeah, maybe that's tricky. How about oxygen? So firstly, to think that they are not actually either or. If we're going to go for a mechanical ventilation strategy, we require lots of oxygen. These ventilators need a driving gas. That's quite often the, the high pressure oxygen uh, to make them work. Um, and there, we also need oxygen just as a therapy itself uh, for the patient. Mechanical ventilation with air is not something that, it, that is uh, considered a uh, good therapy. So we need oxygen anyway. Um, and uh, the treatment, therefore, if we're not going to use mechanical ventilation, is oxygen. Um, and the flow rates are quite interesting to look at. If we're going to treat a patient simply with oxygen, uh, we need to provide them with up to, you could say, 15 litres per minute. Um, and we're working on some studies at the moment to try and quantify that more accurately. You could say the average is probably between three and 10 litres per minute. Uh, for, for patients on oxygen. However, if we're going to ventilate them mechanically, or if we're going to use these intermediate therapies that have quite a lot of attention at the moment, like high flow nasal oxygen or CPAP, BiPAP, non-invasive ventilation, you need very high flows, 15 to 60 liters uh, per minute. Just to touch on the scale up of oxygen. So um, often what is considered the primary thing is, is production of oxygen, making sure we have oxygen in country. And of course that is, is an essential part of it. Um, and there's all these different ways we can create, we can produce uh, more oxygen. Um, the largest way is these pictures on the left, which is liquid oxygen plants, um, producing a lot of oxygen that can then be transported around the country. An alternative uh, method is using um, PSA plants, these slightly smaller plants that are often placed next to hospitals, uh, providing piped oxygen throughout the hospital. Um, both of these types of plants uh, can then be used to fill cylinders that can then either be transported within the hospital or uh, around the country to other facilities that are not producing their own oxygen. Or our final method is these oxygen concentrators that are very widely used uh, in smaller facilities um, that separate out oxygen from air and can provide it uh, ideally to just one patient. So scaling up this production of oxygen definitely has a potential for huge impact in the pandemic. And we should also think that it will benefit many other conditions, not only COVID. Uh, child pneumonia deaths, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of those every year. Maternal conditions, uh, very sick mothers need oxygen, traffic accidents, other trauma victims, uh, all the different infections that are very common around the world and the rising uh, epidemic of non-communicable diseases. These patients, when they become acutely unwell, also need oxygen. So if we have improved oxygen production and supply systems around the world, this really uh, could lead to something positive coming out of this horrible pandemic could be the legacy that, that, that we take forwards uh, for the next 10, 20 years. Raf, over to you. Um, thank you, Tim. So I would, I would take you through how to effectively deliver oxygen therapy. And um, I think the, the main point or the main message we are sending across is that the, the oxygen has to get all the way to the patient's nose. And uh, for the patient to get through the last mile to the patient, we can think of this as a progression, but we are going through different stages. Um, so we are moving from the manufacturer through the hospital administration or hospital health system to the world level where the patients are kept and to the health worker who gives the oxygen, as well as to the patient who is then supposed to receive that oxygen. And um, on a manufacturer level, there are several challenges that can be seen in different low resource settings. For example, several countries have very few in-country plants as well as distribution centers a good example, in Malawi, the main supplier of oxygen, who is Afrox, only has two, two centers for, for oxygen generation. And also the speed of production to meet the demand. During the peak of the pandemic, we had a challenge where production of oxygen was minimal. And looking at the estimates of the ability to generate oxygen in Malawi, only 3% 
of the 818 million liters of required oxygen were available in the peak of the oxygen pandemic. So there were huge, huge shortfalls from there. And you have health facilities that are very far from where you can give them oxygen and the road infrastructure is very poor to get oxygen to them. So the delivery is even delayed further to that. And also it's an issue of cost for the oxygen. So a report also showed that low oil resource settings in Malawi and Uganda, the pricing for oxygen was very different. So we are paying quite a lot of money for per liter of oxygen compared to other countries. And it's good to check what is included in the price for oxygen. So transport costs are also included in that, the taxes on that as well, which also raises the, the high as well. And the procurement system, if health, health facilities are allowed to use the oxygen to get oxygen from a manufacturer without paying for it, maybe they can pay later because oxygen is needed now. Go to the next slide. And looking at the hospital administration, what we've seen is that the procurement systems are very slow. So some health facilities require so many signatories to actually allow oxygen to be paid for or to be purchased, which reduces the speed of which oxygen can be acquired. And also there's limited awareness of how important oxygen is. So when you ask health system administrators what is, what is important in treatment, they really do they mention oxygen as an important treatment they have. And some hospitals have interrupted power supply. I think in this power report, they showed that only eight or six health facilities have a continuous power supply and limited oxygen funding as well. So both internal and external and unreliable oxygen sources. So there is little investment in sustainable oxygen supply and delivery systems as we see in the oncoming slides and very poor maintenance systems as well. So we have several oxygen concentrators in the country that are not functional and have not been maintained for a long time. At, at a world level, we see a practice where oxygen is not part of routine stock treatment. So usually, wards are supposed to provide stocks of the medications they have. So drugs are routinely stocked, but oxygen is not. So this leads to several acute runouts of oxygen without noticing that they were running out, especially those wards that are continuously using cylinders, and also lack of equipment. So pass oximeters are, are, like, are like a big challenge in, in low resource settings. So therefore to identify patients who need oxygen is a challenge. The recent biomedical equipment report in Malawi showed that there is on average one pass oximeter per 54 beds. So you notice that the, the gap there is, is quite huge and that an additional 208 pass oximeters were required because only 123 were available. And also lack of functional concentrators. Um, many concentrators that are there are not functional. And even those that are functional, most of them are not able to deliver the required quality of oxygen. I know Queens is looking into assessing all their concentrators at the moment to give a report, we'll be able to share that later on. And you have an issue of consumables as well. So nozzle cannulas, as an example, only 37% of the required ones were available. So there was also a gap on that to actually give, what device to use to give the oxygen to the patients were limited. Now, looking at the health workers as well, we, we need to understand what knowledge and skills they, they have, as well as what is required. If they're able to identify hypoxia as well as critical illness, because without that identification, a health worker is not going to intervene in the patient's condition. As also able to, a health worker should be able to assess the oxygen needs of their patients and know which type of equipment to use to effectively give oxygen. If a patient needs more than 10 liters of oxygen, they don't need to put them on a nose or prongs, they need maybe a face mask to, to do that. And for this, we are looking into the routines of care, basically closing the, the knowledge and action gap. So health workers tend to know things, but they don't tend to do them. So aiming at closing the no-do gap, 
which with Life Support Foundation, we've had conducted a lot of trainings in critical care, very practical based sessions so that we get health workers to actually do what they know and develop guidelines and protocols that are easier to follow in the world. And I think a classic example is the VSDT protocol team has done in Tanzania, which showed some improvements in, in management of patients in the intensive care unit, as well as management of other aspects of critical illness, which we're also going to talk about that oxygen needs to be provided together with other aspects of critical illness. Um, and this is uh, an algorithm which was developed by the WFSA, which was in, in the beginning of the pandemic for oxygen therapy in limited resource, limited resource settings for treatments of COVID. The key points we see here are that we need pra practical oxygen therapy, which means oxygen we can actually, we are able to give and prioritize prevention of infections in hospital staff. So I'm going to concentrate on the oxygen aspects in this where they're looking at when you have a suspected or confirmed diagnosis of COVID patient, you have to assess the patient before display the signs and symptoms and also check the oxygen saturation. If it's less than 90%, we are initiating them on oxygen, whether it's an adult or a child. And you need to have the delivery, oxygen delivery devices, nozzle prongs or face mask, according to the age of the patient, you know, teaching health workers to adjust the oxygen flow according to the SPO2 targets, try different positions, just so that we effectively deliver the oxygen to the patients. And management of the oxygen delivery devices as well, where we are, you, we are giving, we're using nozzle prongs for the right amount of liters of oxygen. And if a patient needs more liters, we change them to a face mask. If a face mask cannot do it, we use the non, a mask with a reservoir bag with the right amount of oxygen. Just to comment on this, the results of it from the COVID data we're looking at, we had some patients who they were receiving 15 liters of oxygen, but they were just using a simple oxygen mask and we'll be able to share some of those results later on. That's right. And the patient is, is the final target. All we're doing is to get this patient to, to receive the oxygen they need. But what we have seen is that even at a patient level, we will find some challenges in that as well. So religious and cultural beliefs have been shown to hinder oxygen delivery, family and community influences. A lot of, not a lot, some patients refuse to even get oxygen when they are in severe distress because people tend to believe that oxygen is harmful and may even cause death. So looking into that, you see that it also hampers how best we can deliver oxygen. We need to consider also correcting such myths for us to effectively give oxygen to our patients. So it all leads to, for us to effectively give the oxygen, we need to consider all the different challenges in every stage of the oxygen progression. And the oxygen we are going to generate will not work unless it gets all the way to the right patient's lungs at the right time and in the right amount as well. Um, thank you, Tim. I think this was my last slide. Great, thank you so Thanks. much, uh, Raf. Um, so if we move on to uh, a little bit about the types of patients, we're talking about the severe and critical patients. Uh, this is a classic pyramid that came out uh, at the start of the pandemic, um, still used a lot today. There's, there's currently quite a bit of research questioning these numbers, but they're, they're, so far they're the best we have, that severe patients are roughly 15% of, of the COVID cases. And then at the top, you have these patients who have critical COVID disease, roughly 5% of the patients. So, so these are the ones who require oxygen. The patients who are mild and moderate, according to current WHO uh, definitions, do not require any oxygen therapy. Um, and COVID has caused a, a sudden surge in these types of uh, patients, all due to this one uh, condition across the world. But the, the modeling at the beginning of the pandemic was really scary. Thankfully, these numbers have not materialized, particularly in Africa, but the modeling at that time uh, uh, speculated that there would be a roughly 1% of the population who would become uh, oxygen requiring. Uh, that would have been a, a great big challenge. Um, the numbers are less, but it still applies that the ones who become severe and critical, if we don't provide good quality care to them, sadly, many of them will die. 
uh, and the care that these patients require is, uh, I, I would tend to use the term critical care for these. Um, any care for a patient who has a life-threatening acute illness uh, requires this sort of critical care. That doesn't mean uh, high advanced critical care always. Um, the, the care provided within this critical care depends on the available resources. So I like to divide it into essential critical care, intermediate and advanced. Um, and to remember that hypoxia treatment, so the oxygen and mechanical ventilation we've been talking about today, is only one aspect of this critical care. Uh, all the other aspects are also necessary uh, to save the life of the patient. Um, this was pr prior to the pandemic. Uh, there was a call for, from us among several other groups that we really need to uh, look at this uh, requirement for critical care and the care of critically ill patients uh, systematically. Um, and there's a big need throughout the world for, for a greater prioritization and focus uh, on the care of these very sick patients. Um, and it all can be encapsulated, the care that's required in the classic ABC of airway, breathing and circulation. Patients who are critically ill have a compromised airway, they have problems breathing or they have problems uh, with their circulation. And that's what we need to handle uh, in an adequate way. So this concept of uh, essential emergency and critical care, ECC, is trying to bring all of these components together. Um, and it includes the, the fundamental um, aspects such as triage, identification. So a big problem around the world in hospitals everywhere is we don't actually know which patients are the critically ill. Many of them kind of go under the radar and, and are not prioritized and do not have their vital organs supported, pro pro not provided with the essential care they really need. Um, so an increased focus on identifying these patients when they arrive at the hospital and also uh, on the hospital wards if there is a risk they are deteriorating. And the simplest way is using vital signs, doing patient observations uh, regularly, every day, more, more often if, if the patient is unstable, um, with a focus on uh, the identification of hypoxia. So I think... Um, Pulse oximetry is really important, uh, new device, newish, uh, and, and should be increased all over the world, these pulse oximeters that can really identify these patients uh, quickly and effectively. Once we've identified them, we need to provide uh, the ABCs of essential care, um, including stabilizing their airway, their breathing, and their circulation, and then continue observing them because it's not enough to treat them once. These patients can deteriorate. Uh, carry on monitoring their saturations, monitoring their vital signs, uh, modifying the care we are providing to, to optimize um, the, the treatments we are providing. Um, and to think of, of, of care in a holistic way, uh, it's not enough for the consultant physician, the most senior doctor, to make all the big decisions. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary effort, particularly with the, the health workers who are closest to the patient, who are quite often the nurses um, and systems of task sharing. So the whole team should be able to identify the, real, the, the, the patient when they're becoming critically ill and providing the, the um, emergency and critical care. So nurses looking after these patients should have good knowledge and skills. What's it look like at the moment? Uh, sadly, there are substantial deficiencies of this. If we're back to the Malawian uh, setup, uh, one study uh, we did found that of the uh, 1,000 patients served, surveyed, 45 of them, these are the currently inpatients, were hypoxic, and only five were receiving oxygen. So, so there's an unmet need of almost nine in 10 patients uh, in terms of oxygen therapy. Uh, Malawi and Kenya, um, roughly half of the beds are in hospitals with an oxygen supply. Um, and if we think of consumables, this, this survey that Rafk was talking about as well, uh, oropharyngeal airways, which are these small plastic airways uh, for unconscious patients to keep their airways open, uh, only 4% of the, the estimated requirement are currently available in country. So it's a huge lack of, of very basic uh, things. ECC is a way of trying to conceptualize what is needed. Um, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but just to say uh, ECC is based around the pillars of um, identification and care. We have to find the patients and then we have to provide them with the care. Um, and to do that, uh, hospitals need to be ready, which means they need the right equipment and resources and the clinical practice needs to be adequate to use these resources in the optimal way. 
And if we provide all of these, you can see in, in the conceptual framework, we will end up managing to stabilize the critically ill and increase survival. Uh, and what is planned in, in, the, in the subsequent agenda for this is, is bottleneck analyses, where we try and look at where are the bottlenecks for providing uh, this, um, this good care. Is it a lack of uh, resources, a lack of hospital readiness, a lack of clinical practice? In which aspects uh, are, we, are we struggling the most? Um, identification is things like triage uh, of vital signs at arrival and on the wards. Um, I think a key thing that is not talked about so much is something uh, around labeling the patient. So if a critically ill patient is identified, they should be labeled in some way so that the, all of the team know what they're dealing with. Uh, this can be done verbally. It's very useful in a team situation for someone to say, a patient in bed five is critically ill. That, that kind of uh, pulls everyone together. We all know what we're doing. Or it could be done with a traffic light system that you have uh, some red patients, some yellow patients, some green patients, and it's the red ones who are critically ill who we, who we need to prioritize. Those ones who are critically ill uh, can have an increased uh, frequency of observations. So we see what's happening to them if they're getting better or worse. Um, and using all of the vital signs we have uh, in, in order to do this observations. And remember the, the basics around uh, documentation and communication so that the whole team is aware of what we're doing uh, and we can follow trends. Tre trends are so important in, in the care of very sick patients. Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Um, when trying to find the signs of illness severity in very low resource settings, it could be enough to see if the patient is able to walk. There's more and more evidence coming up that that's enough. It's the patients who are unable, unable to walk unaided who are the ones who have high risk of, of dying in hospital. Um, or can they talk in full sentences? If you have a bit more resources, the vital signs and the oxygen saturation. Sadly, these signs are often not an established part of healthcare. Um, both at admission on the wards, and even when they are done, they may not be acted upon. Uh, so having some clear protocols, task sharing, like uh, we discussed, um, where nurses are allowed to initiate the simple uh, therapies if they identify a very deranged vital signs. Um, and if they are acted upon, make sure that these protocols uh, contain the actions uh, that are kind of uh, the correct ones to be done. Um, and any, any systemic bottlenecks that we identify should then be overcome, whether it's around the equipment, the processes, uh, maintenance of equipment, anything like that. Always, I think we need to remember the principle of learning how to walk before we can run. So the essentials should be in place before we uh, aim for the more advanced care. And then, as I've said, systems of rechecking, monitoring, checking whether our therapies are working. The care, I'm going to go through this very quickly for the sake of time, but the ABC care includes these simple maneuvers for a, a blocked or threatened airway, such as uh, positioning the patient right. Uh, an unconscious patient should be nursed in lying on their side, not flat on their back. Uh, oxygen therapy for hypoxia, rest on over that. Uh, and managing shock if a patient has a compromised circulation, the mainstay of treatment is IV fluids, um, and there's other things that can be done. Um, I think an important principle is a, a critically ill patient uh, requires input from the whole team and it should be a good reason to call on senior health workers to come and assist. Um, and the patients who are not responding to care are the ones who require increased in, uh, care intensity, um, which also means we can save resources for the ones who are stable, the ones who are improving, and also for the ones who, who are no longer uh, responding to therapy and we decide it's no longer in their interest to, to aim for curative care and they need palliative care. Why is this essential care not being done? I think if we look at trying to understand the, the underlying reasons, I think it's not generally seen as a political priority. Uh, I get the feeling COVID is changing this, so this is maybe an opportunity for all of us interested in this. Um, health facilities tend to be specialty based or based on certain diagnoses, big initiatives, vertical programs in malaria, HIV, TB, these sorts of things, rather than this sort of horizontal severity focus. Um, the high resource focus, I think many initiatives like to focus on the, the, the glamorous treatments, the high resource, the sophisticated care, mechanical ventilation being a good example, and, and the more mundane 
basic care can be forgotten. Um, but also we have felt that there's been a lack of a specified package or, or a defined agenda around this, which is where our EECC package came along. So we've specified a package. Uh, we also think that's what's going to be required is some redesign of health services. Uh, for example, improved triage uh, in, at arrival to hospital, uh, which may need a triage station, a resuscitation room in the outpatient department, things like this. Um, definitely a big focus on the health workers, training and improved guide, uh, routines and guidelines, uh, job aids for the health workers. And, and overarching everything is, is political advocacy uh, research, trying to, trying to change uh, the way that these things are discussed in, in global health. Um, this is just been published uh, as a preprint a few days ago, um, a consensus project we have done um, uh, among different global clinical experts. Um, so you can see the link there. Um, and we basically, specified which are the processes in essential emergency and critical care and what hospitals uh, need to be able to provide these processes. So please uh, click on that link, go to that link and, and see, see um, what is thought of by clinical experts to be the, the essential care for very sick patients. Uh, this is the protocol RAF mentioned, so a piece of paper that, that indicates when vital signs, this is on an intensive care unit in Tanzania, are very deranged and task shares with the nurses for what they can do about it. And what, what this piece of paper showed uh, was an increased um, action by the, by the team uh, to treat these uh, dangerous deranged vital signs um, and a reduction in mortality, at least among the patients who, who came in with low blood pressure. To finish off, what could be the impact uh, if we all manage to focus on these essential things, including a very effective oxygen therapy that we've discussed? Well, this is just a back of an envelope calculation. If, if it could prevent one in 10 deaths from critical illness, um, it's been estimated that half a million lives could be saved every year. Um, and that uh, in the current pandemic has even been increased further than that. So, so this is really something which is kind of technical and within hospitals and yet can have a population impact. We're finishing off here, but back to the take home messages. So if we can think that we all need to be part of this process for increasing oxygen production and supply, um, if this can be done, then we really will have a, a, a positive legacy in the pandemic. Um, which helps us manage COVID, but also for all other uh, acute diseases. However, we, we must not forget the last mile of oxygen delivery all the way to the patient's nose. Um, and and to, to, to make sure we are providing this oxygen to the right patients, which requires us to have these concepts of identification um, and to provide it at the right time and in the right ways. So good treatment protocols, guidelines, uh, routines of working. Um, and to include in our package all of these other aspects of essential care, the most basic care that is needed by these very sick patients. So if we don't forget that, uh, we will manage to uh, optimize the impact of oxygen um, and save many lives. Thank you very much for me and Raf. Thank you, Raf. Thank you, Tim, for the great talk. Um, Reminder to the participants to please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll go ahead and start the Q&A portion and welcome to Robert Neighbor as well. Um, first question, among COVID-19 patients who have hypoxia, roughly what percentage can be managed with conventional oxygen delivery devices, i.e. no more than 15 liters a minute versus more specialized or higher flow oxygen delivery or mechanical ventilation? Uh, perhaps um, maybe Raf and Tim, if you could comment on uh, what you have observed and also what you know of in the literature. I think it's um, I think it's a very good question, um, and I, I would probably refer back for the best answer, refer back to that pyramid and say it's five percent are critical and fifteen percent are severe. Um, however, I think that is an oversimplification and. Um, I would rather probably twist the question around and think what should we be providing to these patients and the first thing to ensure that we provide is this good level essential care, um, which is the oxygen therapy and all other aspects and that should be for all of these patients. Uh, then, then it's true that some patients are too sick uh, to survive with just that care. 
Um, but the proportion who should be provided with a higher level of care must depend on the resources available in that system. Uh, so it's very difficult to give uh, a good answer for that. Uh, it also depends, of course, on the underlying um, epidemiology and demographics of the population. So, so I think we will get a very different answer if we look in the US or Europe during this pandemic, where we have very elderly population, um, as opposed to if we look in, in Africa, where the, the median age is less than, than 18, for example. But a rule of thumb is probably that 5% would need more advanced therapy than the oxygen therapy alone. alone. Um, whether that is mechanical ventilation or high flow or CPAP, um, I think I'm not the expert to, to mention that. So definitely during the pandemic, uh, there's been more of a trend to move over to these non-intubation uh, methods, non-invasive methods. So some of this 5% can definitely be managed without intubation. Thanks for that. Any other comments from the panel on that specific question? Okay, uh, moving on, next question. Um, with the rapid surge in investment in oxygen scale up, what concerns do you have on unintended, unintended consequences? Um, maybe uh, Robert, we could start with you on that one. Um, I do have uh, a number of concerns. We've, um, across the world, we've supplied a very large number of oxygen concentrators and PSA plants and it's often quite easy to find the money for the capital spend, but it's all the backup systems that are required. I mean, if you look at PSA plants, there should be quite a bit of planning and preparation before they go in. Um, you need to, the right site, it needs to be at the right location. Um, it's normally a building that requires good ventilation, stable electricity to keep it running. Um, we're talking about high pressures, so there's a, a, an issue of security and safety in there as well. Um, and we need all the ancillary equipment to go around them. And I am concerned that we'll end up with a lot of plant in locations without the equipment to support it. And the same applies to oxygen concentrators. There's been fairly large numbers shipped to, to low resources without the support um, and the training that should go with them. Um, and if they're not looked after properly, they're not supported or they're misused, they will fail. And that will do great damage to the um, reputation of oxygen concentrators in low resources. And, and in the past, they've been a, a stable supply of oxygen in many locations, often the principal supply of oxygen. So I do have concerns around that. Uh, Rath or Tim, any comment? Um, I think I could, I, I, I'm, I share Robert's uh, concerns. Um, Absolutely. I, I think mechanical ventilation is, 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 has an extra level of possible negative uh, impact because it can suck over resources to a very few patients. Uh, it can suck over oxygen because of the high flows that are required. So in, during the pandemic, we've seen all over the world a lack of oxygen causing uh, terrible suffering and the mechanical ventilators can uh, use the, the, the equivalent oxygen that's needed for 10 or 20 patients at the same time. So um, and also staffing. If you end up with an ICU that's that's managing just a few patients, you may have a, a very high amount of staffing there and resources going for that, and, and they have to come from somewhere. So I think the opportunity costs of a very high resource mechanical ventilation and ICU uh, have to be thought of very, very carefully. Thanks, Tim. Um, Raf, maybe this question for you. Um, what, are, what is the biggest single barrier to last mile oxygen delivery? Um, to the extent it can be distilled down. i uh, wondering if you could comment on that. Um, yes, good question. Um, so I'm, I'm going to answer this in the sense that, that the biggest barrier, it's something which if it fails, it's difficult for us to modify it. Um, knowledge of health workers can be improved. So it's not a big barrier, but now oxygen generation capacity and its continuous supply in, in, in health facilities is a big barrier. 
Um, I'll give an example in Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, for example, we have a PSA plant which was set up last year, but sometime in January, the plant actually failed to work. It had a fault. We don't know which, what was the problem yet. And I think we lost quite a lot of patients in one day because the plant was not working. But when you then make a request that we need more oxygen, people would often ask, what is happening to your plant? This is something which is difficult to, to tell people that even when you have a plant on site that was not you know, quantified to what, what capacity it can give when you're in huge need, for example, in COVID, that continuous supply, it's, it gets affected. So I would say that that, that is a big, a big challenge. Can I add something to that, please? Um, the, one of the other issues around PSA plants is that I found when they've been installed into a, a hospital situation, the um, use of oxygen usually doubles or even quadruples as a result of that because of its availability or easier availability. Um, and it does often put all the eggs in one basket. Um, the other issue that I've found, uh, the biggest um, uh, barrier to last mile has been oxygen regulators for cylinders. I get more requests about oxygen regulators than I do for anything else. Um, and without good solid regulators that uh, are robust, you can't deliver anything from a cylinder. Thanks, Robert, for that comment. Thanks, Raph. Um, on the topic of, of PSAs, Robert, do you have any, any comment on uh, like most common reasons for failure for PSA plants? Um, this seems to be something that's made the news a few times over the last year. Raph just mentioned it. Any comment on that? It's lack of ability to carry out proper maintenance is, is often the case, or access to spare parts. Um, so a number of these plants get put in without any sort of uh, plan maintenance um, programs. Um, and they do require quite a lot of, of maintenance. You're talking about very high pressures. You're talking about some fairly complex equipment. Um, so you know, without the maintenance, they do um, suffer. And many cylinders are now filled from um, PSA plants in Africa. And I have seen cylinders down to 50% O2 um, where plants haven't been maintained properly. Okay, um, next question is for um, Raf and Tim. Uh, what's next for EECC? How will you design content and implement strategies to address the challenges that you identified? Um, so we're currently working on a, on a project called the Poetic Project to do exactly that. Uh, we want to carry out um, an understanding, uh, firstly, of the, the costs of EECC in different settings and its effectiveness, so enabling us to come up with estimates of cost effectiveness. Um, we want to understand the bottlenecks. I, I, I briefly showed a bottleneck uh, analysis slide. So working out where the weaknesses are in the system, um, and that will lead us on to implementation research, how we tackle those bottlenecks. Uh, do we need to increase equipment? Do we need to uh, improve the clinical processes? Is our main, uh, the main problem uh, around identification or is the main problem around care? All of these questions. So we, we, we hope to come up with an implementation research agenda uh, and findings um, that can then enable us to increase the impact uh, in many different global settings. Any other comments on that uh, before we move to the next question? Oh, no, no comment from me. Okay, thanks, Raf. Um, next question, uh, can you speak to how you are addressing the challenges associated with lack of standardized oxygen equipment and any workarounds that you found most effective? Um, Maybe uh, Robert and Raf, if you want to comment on that. Uh, I'm sure Raf will have um, some comments to make on that. Um, it is a big problem. Um, when we talk about international standards, um, they don't seem to stretch as far as um, uh, equipment on oxygen for cylinders. Um, 
even the terminology is very poor. Um, colors vary enormously and outlets for, um, uh, for um, oxygen really do vary greatly. I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, I think uh, people on the ground in most low resources are very flexible and very creative in their supplies, providing they can do it in a, a safe way. Um, they will be very uh, creative in their solutions. But it, at the moment, we don't have any good solid standardization of oxygen outlets. Yeah, and uh, I agree with Robert on that. Um, I, I think so far, because, uh, because we've seen quite a huge need of oxygen, the focus has been on can we get oxygen, yes or no? So whoever has offered to donate concentrators, for example, they, the question is not asked on what type of concentrators are they, or can our physicians or can our technicians fix them if there's something is wrong? So the focus has just been, if it can deliver oxygen, we want it. So we haven't standardized that yet. And I think it might take some time before we actually get to standardize it. Okay, um, any final questions? There's one question about what resources would you recommend to uh, better learn how to correctly use and maintain oxygen concentrators? Um, I'll paste a, a link in here of one resource. Um, I don't know if any of the panelists would like to share any other resources. Okay. Um, well, we have uh, one final question here. Among patients with severe disease, uh, how many patients can be managed with conventional supplemental oxygen versus needing high flow or uh, mechanical ventilation? Um, Tim, I think you you provided some info on that. I, and um, over to you, I'm happy to add some commentary as well. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's a it's a tricky one, and I guess I guess it challenges even what we mean by when the question is asked of well, how many can we manage with different things. I, I would twist it around and think what is what we maybe want to know is what is the ideal therapy for for some patients, um, because you know we 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 can manage patients in any way we like. We just end up with different mortality uh, figures. So. Um, the high flow, I would say high flow and non-invasive is, is something for critical patients um, rather than the severe patients. So I would say it's as a rule of thumb, which I think could definitely be questioned and, and, and is ongoing research is looking at this, it's probably 5% who need something beyond oxygen therapy. Uh, severe patients can be managed just with, with simple oxygen therapy. Um, so as a rule of thumb, it would be we will miss these 5% uh, if we only provide that. But I think even that's not, not accurate. I think some of these critical patients will absolutely survive if we cannot provide them any more therapy than 10 or 15 litres on a non-rebreather mask. I think we will, have, we will not have 100% mortality in them. So there isn't a direct correlate between severe, critical and the mode of therapy that they require. Um, All right. Well, thank you, Tim. We're at the hour, and so I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Robert Neighbor, Raf Kazaduli, and Tim Baker for joining us and taking the time. Um, if there are any follow-up questions from the webinar, please reach out to us through the portals, and we'd be happy to continue answering those questions and providing resources. Thanks for everybody's time, and you'll be able to find a recording of this available on the portal in the coming days. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.